everyone. Welcome to Ridge Online this week. Glad that you're joining us. The sermon's going to start in just a minute. We just want to let you know a couple of things happening around the place. Uh, in August, we have a team of volunteers headed to Camp Quanos uh, to volunteer there, just help the amazing ministry that's, helping, that's happening there. And if you want to join, if you want to be part of that, uh, check it out online. Uh, we'd be glad to have you come and serve with us. Uh, then next week, uh, it's going to be a family service here at the church. It's summertime. Our vacation Bible school will, will just be finished. We want to give our volunteers a break again, which just means a shorter service. Kids will be in service with us. Uh, but it's a beautiful thing as we celebrate together. And then finally, I want to remind you that Summer Swing is coming up. It's August 13th. It's Sunday right after church. And... Um, and it's just a, a church-wide picnic. It's a great time. We do base, baseball and hot dogs and hang out. And it's a great place to make connections and just to enjoy this summer together. So I just want to invite you to put that on your, on your calendar, plan to come. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to uh, walking with you as we follow Jesus together. Well, welcome today. So glad to have you here. My name is Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here. A, a couple of months ago, one of my kids ended up in emergency. And uh, it was a minor thing. It wasn't a big deal. But we ended up there, as you know, for a long time, especially the more minor it is, the longer you sit. And so we ended up really thirsty. And so I went looking for some water and I wandered down the hallway till I came to the vending machine. And did you know that to get a bottle of water in an emergency room in Canada, the cost was like five dollars. I literally had to call, pull my credit card to buy a bottle of water uh, at the vending machine there. It's a little bit crazy, some serious inflation going on. If you're a little bit, uh, you know, if you've been around for a while, you know that there used to be a time when you could put like 75 cents or 50 cents, or if you've been around for a long time, 25 cents in, and the, and the you know, and the, and the pop or the chips would come out of the machine. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the vending machines go back so far, they were invented in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and uh, when they were first invented, it was a penny. Some of you have not even seen a penny, but you put a penny in and it would go in the machine and it would take a little while for it to kind of make its way through all the different mechanisms until at the bottom it dropped and then whatever the machine back then was would give to you. It would give you uh, stamps in that day or postcards or, or even uh, surprisingly it would take your picture. Um, and, and what developed from that time was this expression called, the, 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 this expression is this, the penny dropped. And it's maybe not as common an expression these days, but it comes from the world of vending machines. But it came to, to mean that moment when a person suddenly realizes something that, that they ha hadn't seen before. And it had been all around them, but for the first time, they kind of saw it. I remember when uh, Newell and I, when we uh, were new parents, we uh, our first daughter was born, and it was a couple of months in. And I remember one day holding that, that baby, and we, I mean, we just worked hard all the time, sleep and eat and, and nap and play and all that stuff. And it, it, and it suddenly, in that moment, it suddenly dawned on me the kind of investment and energy and sacrifice and hard work that my parents had poured into me all those years. And I realized, oh, I'm going to do this for a long time to come. And, and even though I had been in the midst of all that, even though I'd experienced all that love and sacrifice and, and, and energy and time when I was a kid, it was only at that moment that the penny kind of dropped. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is what parenting is about. This, this is what they did for me. And that's where this expression comes from. Or, or that's the idea of the, behind this expression. And in this story that we're looking at today in John, we come to the part of the story where the penny finally drops. Today we come to the part where a bunch of people that Jesus is talking to finally suddenly say, oh, oh, I get it, I, I, I understand. And it's been part of this story that we've been looking at. It's a fairly long story. We're in, in John chapter 6. We're already in verses 60 to 71 today. But it began at the beginning of this uh, chapter with Jesus feeding the 5,000. And he feeds them with five loaves and two fish. It's an incredible miracle. And, and then there's this drama that takes place over the next day or so. Where the, the crowds go away and the disciples travel through a storm at night and they end up in Capernaum. And, and these people follow him back and they want more bread from him. They want more food. And Jesus says, look, look now, you're, you're asking for the wrong thing. You're asking for physical bread, but you should be asking for the, the bread of life. 
because I will satisfy that spiritual hunger that is in every single individual that can only be satisfied by me, by, by God in their life. And so he, he offers them that. And, and then he says this, that they must, if they, if they want that, if they want to have that hunger satisfied in their life, they must eat his flesh and drink his blood. In fact, this is, this is what he says in, in verse 53. It says this. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Now you can imagine after he teaches this, after he says this, that the, the people standing there, their eyes are kind of wide, like, wow. That's, that's really, I mean, that's quite the thing to say. But, but, and now we come to the part of the story that we're going to look at today. And in verse 60, it says how they responded. It says this, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Notice that they don't say this is a hard teaching. Who can understand it? They understand now what, what Jesus is actually trying to say. They say and said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Because you see, when Jesus first started talking like this, they, they were kind of like, well, maybe this is some twisted, weird thing about cannibalism and eating Jesus' real flesh and drinking his real blood. But, but, but now they finally understand that what Jesus is talking about is, is that if you're going to follow him, if you're going to be a true disciple of his, that Jesus has to be the sustenance for your life. He, he has to be the, the, the one who gives you life, who makes you tick. He's the one who, who sustains you and gives you energy and life and direction and purpose every single day. He says, I have to be that in your life. Because see, everyone has something like that in their life. Everyone has something that is the, the thing that makes them tick, that, that sustains them, that gives them vision and purpose and direction in their life. For some people, it's their career. For some people, it's their family. For others, it's money, and their investments. For some people, it's sex and their bodies and how good they look. For some people, it's the fact that other people need them. I mean, everybody's got something that is that sort of the, the, the flesh that they eat and the blood that they drink that sustains them and keeps them going in all of their life. And, and that's why sometimes when they lose that thing, whatever it is, they end up committing suicide. I mean, if you read back in, the, in 1929 when the stock market crashed overnight, some of the wealthiest people went to the top of their high-rise towers with their now useless stocks that weren't worth the paper they were written on and threw those stocks over the edge and then jumped themselves and plummeted to their death. Why? Because, because it was the money and the investments that was the, the flesh that they ate and the blood that they drank. It was what sustained their life. And when it was gone, they had no reason left to live. And, um, and this is what Jesus is saying here. He's making it progressively more and more clear as he's been talking to them. And that's this, if they want to follow them, him, if they want to be his disciples, they must utterly and totally put Jesus at the center of their life. See, what Jesus is making here is an incredible claim of lordship over anybody who is going to be his followers. He has to be in charge of every aspect of their life. In fact, they must see all the rest of their life their career, their family, their, their money and their relationships, their sex, their, their relationships with others. They must see all of that and live all of that through the lens of who Jesus is and what he calls them to do. That's what Jesus is saying here. And, and it's at this moment that the penny drops for those who are listening to him. It's this moment they realize what Jesus is saying. And for many of them, their response is this. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? I mean, it was a hard teaching in the culture of that day. It's definitely a hard teaching in the culture of this day. In a day where we're so individualistic, so committed to our autonomy. I mean, we say this, people say this, well, no one's going to tell me what to believe or how to live. I'm going to decide for myself. And I'm going to take a little bit from, from Zen Buddhism 
a little bit from Gandhi, maybe a, 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 bit, of, a bit of idea and wisdom from Martin, Jr., uh, Martin Luther King Jr., some from Jesus, some from this great random influencer that I saw on TikTok, a little bit from Joe Rogan, some from Jordan Peterson, and I'm going to decide for myself what I believe and how it is that I'm going to live. But Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. I must decide how you live your life. You can listen to all those other people. You can glean some good things from them, but only if they line up with what I say and who I am. Because I, if you're going to follow me, I'm going to be the Lord of your life. I'm the bread of life for you. Now, that's, that's not popular. It's not hard to understand. But it is hard to accept. And there are a couple of different ways that people respond when they finally understand what Jesus is saying. There's a lot of people who would say that they're, they're not followers of Jesus because they actually understand exactly what Jesus expects of them. They understand his demand to be Lord of their life. And they look at it and they say, no. I'm not going to let him be. I don't want him to be. I'm out. There are others who say, oh, Jesus wants to be the Lord of my life. I, I, I'm going to follow him. I, I'm going to allow him to be the Lord in my life. I might not get it right all the time. I might not do it perfectly. I might struggle with it. But my intention is I accept Jesus' claim to be Lord of my life. And so you have those who, are, those who are believers in Jesus, who are true disciples, those who have rejected Jesus. But then there's this third crowd. This is the crowd that Jesus is talking about here. And, 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 and this crowd is what as Soren Kierkegaard, the, the 19th century Danish philosopher, calls the admirers of Jesus. They're not true disciples, but they admire Jesus. They, they like him. They look up to him. They, they, they want something from him. And they like much of what he has to say. But they always kind of keep him at a bit of arm's, uh, arm's length distance. You see, they, they, they are not true disciples. For, for this group, and, and that's the group that Jesus is talking about here in this story. And now for them, the penny is suddenly dropped. And it rattles them. And it bothers them. And, and Jesus knows it. In verse 61, he says to them, does this offend you? Yeah. That you would require, demand to be the Lord of my life? That's offensive to me. And Jesus says, that's okay. And then he goes on to explain it one more time. And then he says this to, to them in verse 64. He says, yet there are some of you who do not believe. There are some of you here who simply, you're following, you're, you're, you're here, but you don't believe. And, and John goes on to explain, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. See, this group, I mean, I mean Jesus knows about the non-believers and I mean, they love it, but he's fine with it. He, he knows about those who are his true disciples, but this group here, the, the admirers, it makes Jesus, I don't know if that's right, the right term, but it kind of makes him nervous. It makes him wary of them and, and and, and he's very much aware of them. I mean, he, he, he talks about this group a number of times. He talks about, he tells a parable about 10 virgins who were invited to a wedding to, to, to visit the bridegroom. And while they waited for him, they all looked the same. At a glance, they were like all the same. But five were prepared for him and five weren't. When the bridegroom came, half of them split. They were gone. He says, look, the, half of them were true disciples. And half of them were simply admirers of Jesus. Tells another parable where he, uh, he talks about the, the sower and the seeds, about four different types of soil. And the sower throws the seeds on all the different soils. And in a bunch of those soils, the plants take root and they begin to grow and there's life everywhere. But only one of the four actually is good soil where the fruit, the, the, the plant goes deep and it, it produces lots of fruit. The other ones, the seeds are trampled on and the, and the, and the, and the plants die quickly. He says, there's, this, there's these people there that are simply admirers. They like it from a distance. And, that, and, and, and this group that Jesus is talking to, that's what he's talking to right now. The, the admirers. And they, they admire him for different reasons. Some are there because 
They just came with the crowds. Verse 2 says these crowds came to hear Jesus. And there are some who, who were caught up with everyone else and just came to see who Jesus was and what he was doing. They were part of the, part of the crowd. And, and this has been the case for us in this part of the world, in the Western part of the world, in what has been called Christendom. This idea that a whole culture engages and embraces the, the Christianity, which means that within those who identify as Christians, there are all sorts of people who are simply admirers of Jesus. They call themselves Christians, but they're there simply because, because everyone else is there. Because being a Christian was a good thing to do. It was maybe advantageous for them for business. It made good connections for them. This has been the case was the case certainly in Canada for many years and until recently has been the case in the United States. But now, now being part of the Christian crowd is not, not so popular. It's not looked upon so highly. And so nowadays, sometimes you read in the media and they'll say, oh, the number of Christians, especially in the United States, is just dropping, dropping, dropping. And it is. But what's dropping is not those who are true and genuine followers of Jesus, but the admirers, those who were there simply because it was good for business. It was good for their relationships. It was good in their world. The fact of the matter is the true number of believers, those who are genuinely committed to following Jesus is quietly growing. We just don't hear about it in the census data because many admirers are dropping and will continue to drop for the next little while until, until that sort of process is done. See, some follow Jesus simply because of the crowds. If you read on in this story, others admire Jesus because they see him doing miracles. They, they saw Jesus, uh, you know, bringing bread and fish to people and, and they wanted that. And today, again, there are some who say, I want, I want you know, I, I admire Jesus because I want him to do in my life the kinds of change and transformation that he's done in the lives of others. But, but I don't actually want to submit fully to him. I just want him to do in my life what he's done in the lives of those who have truly committed to him. They want him to do it on their terms. They want him to heal, their, heal them and give them hope and take away their fears. But they don't want Jesus to be their Lord. They want him to be their business partner. And so they come to church. And they do good deeds. And then they live a moral life and they pray. And they, and they're, but they're expecting a return, a, a return on their investment. They're making these, these sacrifices, but they're, they're expecting that Jesus will do something for them on their time and in their way. And when he doesn't, they don't understand why. And the problem is that Jesus has no interest in being anyone's business partner. It doesn't work that way. He wants to be their Lord or nothing at all. I mean, you remember in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the first king of Israel was a man named Saul. And at one point, God said to Saul, I want you to go and, and, and attack this group, uh, these people called the Amalekites. I want you to wipe them out. Don't take anything from them. Just destroy it all. Their camel and their sheep and their goats and, and their cattle. I mean, everything. But Saul doesn't. He, he spares a bunch of that stuff and he brings it back. And God sends the prophet Samuel to him and says, Saul. What are you doing? Wasn't it clear what God told you to do? And Saul said, yeah, 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 I know. But, 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 but I'm going to sacrifice all of these animals to the Lord. He should be pleased. And, and Samuel spoke these prophetic words from God. He said this, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. It's great to come to church. It's important to do good deeds. We should live moral lives. It's vital to pray. But above all, what Jesus requires of us is obedience. To accept him as Lord in every area of your life. And if you're unwilling to do that, I mean, not if you struggle with it, not, not if you, you know, work at it and find it challenging, but if you simply say, look, I, I'm not willing to submit all of my life to Jesus, then you're not actually a true disciple of Jesus. You're simply an admirer of him. It's the second group that we see in this story. The, 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 the third group, there's another group uh, of admirers that we counter in the stories, and they're the ones that want to use Jesus for political purposes. They wanted to make Jesus their king by force if necessary. 
Because you see, they wanted Jesus to, 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 to go and to, and to wipe out the pagan rulers of their land and to install a government that would live and operate according to godly principles. But it was their agenda, not Jesus' agenda. And Jesus would have nothing to do with it. You see, we've said this a number of times here at Ridge Church, and that's this, that there's nothing wrong with Christians being involved in politics in this country. In fact, it's one of the privileges that we have living in a democratic society. We should all vote. And, and, and if you want to be involved in politics with whatever party you have an affinity to, is great. That's not a problem at all. But if you try to take Jesus and make him a, a political weapon against those who have a po different political view than you, then you're missing what Jesus is about. And then you move from, from true disciple to simply being an admirer of Jesus, someone who wants to use him to forward something that you've got going in your life. And Jesus is no part of that. Admirers are looking for Jesus to do something for them. And they're fine with being associated with him as long as he does what they want him to do. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't become the savior that they want him to be, if it becomes inconvenient to follow Jesus, if it becomes embarrassing to be associated with him, if it becomes dangerous to be a follower of Jesus, then they're out, then they're gone. And the ultimate example of that is Judas himself who was right there the whole way, and yet he wanted Jesus to be this political Messiah. And when it became clear that he wasn't going to be, then he was quick to sell him and betray him. That's, that's what John points out here. Jesus says this in verse 70. Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the 12, was later to betray him. See, Jesus is rightfully wary of the admirers. Because for many of them, the penny hasn't dropped yet. They don't quite get what he's all about. Now, you remember back in the day, if you, if you put coins in the vending machine and they didn't get all the way down, how did you solve that problem? Right? You, you bang that thing, didn't you? You bang it to try to make that penny drop all the way. And now, that's what we see Jesus do over and over in his ministry. In all these different places, when he comes to people who are stuck, people who are admirers, people who want to play, let's play a deal with Jesus. When he meets them, he kind of bangs their machine to try to get the penny to drop. I mean, we see it here in this passage that we've been looking at. When they first come to him and say, Jesus, we want you to give us bread. He says, no, 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 you should believe in me. They, they don't quite get it. So he says, look, I'm the bread from heaven. I'll come to, to come, come to." Uh, deal with your spiritual hunger. They're like, huh? He says, look, I'm the bread of life. I have come to give you eternal life. They're like, huh? Finally, he bangs the machine. He says, look, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. They're like, oh, oh, that's the commitment you want from us, Jesus. Yes. And then the penny drops. In another place, you read about a rich young man who comes to him and says, teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. He's like, yeah. I have, I, I, I have. And, and we listen, we're like, oh, there's the guy, Jesus. He's young, he's got it all together. He's, you know, he's probably dressed fine. He, he's wealthy, he's living a good life. Jesus, here's your guy. And Jesus says, one thing you like, you gotta go sell all your money, all your riches and give it to the poor and then follow me. Now, why does Jesus do that? Because he, he, he doesn't like people who have money? Of course not. That's not the issue. What he's doing is he's banging the machine. He's saying, look, if you like your money, if your money is more important to you than me, then you're an admirer, not a follower. I must be more important than even all of your wealth if you're going to be a disciple of me. At another place, a man comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I want to follow you, but first let me bury my father. And Jesus says, you follow me and let the dead bury themselves. What's happening? Jesus had bang in the machine again. He's not saying that you shouldn't care for your parents in their elderly age. What he's saying is that your allegiance to him must trump even that to your elderly parents. In another place, he says this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now again, he's not saying that you should hate your family. 
Any more than he's saying that you should, should, you know, literally eat his flesh and drink his blood. I mean, he teaches you that you should love not only your family, but your, your, your neighbors and your friends and even your enemies. But what he's saying is this. Your allegiance to him must trump your family. It must trump your mother and your father. It must trump your brother and your sister. It must trump your, 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 your children. It must trump your relationship with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. He's saying, if you're going to follow me, I must be first in your life. In fact, what he says right after this is this. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not give up their life so that I might give them my life cannot be my disciple. You must submit completely. I must be God in your life. Philip Yancey writes this. The historian of Alcoholics Anonymous titled his work, Not God, because he said that stands as the most important hurdle an addicted person must surmount, to acknowledge deep in the soul not being God. No mastery of manipulation and control at which alcohols, uh, alcoholics excel can overcome the root problem. Rather, the alcoholic must recognize individual helplessness and fall back in the arms of the higher power. First of all, we had to quit playing God, concluded the founders of AA, and then, then allow God himself to play God in the addict's life, which involves daily, even moment by moment, surrender. What's true for those who are addicted to alcohol is true for each of us. If you want God to work in your life, if you want Jesus to genuinely change and transform you, if you want him to heal your brokenness and to use your giftedness, then you have to surrender to him completely. Otherwise, otherwise you're just an admirer. Otherwise, you're just a business partner with someone who doesn't want to be in business with you. And not much will happen. And you'll look at, at your life and, and you'll look at Christianity and say, I don't understand why it's so powerless. I don't understand why nothing's happening in my life. And the first time that it becomes really inconvenient to follow Jesus or when it becomes even more embarrassing in the eyes of the world to be associated with Jesus or if ever it becomes downright dangerous, you'll be out because you never were really in. That's what happens here when the penny drops. Verse 66 says this, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. When the penny dropped, many who appeared to be following Jesus said, oh, that's what it's about? I'm out. Many, but not all. Jesus turns to his 12 disciples and he asks them, he says this, you don't want to leave me too, do you? And Simon Peter, he answers this way, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter gives here the most simple definition of what it means to be a Christian. First, he admits that he's helpless. It's at the heart of the, of the teachings of who we are in God's sight. We just can't do it on our own. We can't fix ourselves. We can't solve our problems. We can't save ourselves. We are helpless and we need God to work in our lives. And then that's why, again, when many people understand what the scriptures actually teach, what the Bible actually teaches, they're out. They're like, no. I, I'm not going to do that. But many others of us say, no, 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 I can do it. I just want Jesus to ride with me. I, I just want him to help me when there's trouble. You know, uh, quite a few years ago already now, back uh, in the early 2000s, when the, when the um, reality show thing was such a big craze, I had a friend who wanted to do a reality show. He wanted, in fact, he found someone that would uh, do the videotaping. He wanted to drive a motorcycle from Alaska down all the way through North America, South America, to the tip of South America. And, uh, and, but he didn't just want to ride a motorcycle. He wanted to have a sidecar on that motorcycle and have his wife ride all the way down there with him in the sidecar. Now, at that time, I'd only been married a year or two. I didn't know a lot, but I was thinking... I don't think that's a very good recipe for a happy marriage to have your wife sit in a sidecar as you drive all the way to South America. Turns out, I think she didn't think it was such a great idea either. So he came back, he said, John, you should do it. And I'm like, what? 
Me? What, what would I do? He said, look, all you have to do is sit there and enjoy the ride. And, and if we come to some like bad spot in Central America, where if we run into some drug lords or something like that, it, literally, this is what he said to me. You just have to be willing to pull out a flare gun and shoot them with a flare gun so we can get away. Really? Are you kidding me? Not a chance. Not a chance. But that's often our attitude about Jesus. Jesus, I know where we're starting I know where we're going to end up. I know how we're going to get there. I'm going to do all the driving. I just want you to ride in the sidecar. And if we get into a tight spot, I want you to get out the flare gun so we can get away. And Jesus, I mean, it doesn't work that way. If you're going to follow him, he must be Lord of your life. He must be in control. Which leads to the second, the second part of being a true disciple. That says you must trust him. You must utterly trust him in all that he says and does. Lord, you alone have the words of eternal life. We know who you are. We believe with all our hearts that you are God. And so we trust you. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that anyone who has any conceivable alternative to Jesus Christ is not a Christian. You have to trust him completely. You might have read in the news this week, I don't know if you did, but in the news this week that Larry Nasser was stabbed. Now, if you don't know who Larry Nasser is, he is a man who was in prison. He was stabbed in prison. He's doing a 175-year jail term uh, for sexually assaulting 150 uh, young gymnasts in the U.S. gymnastics program when he was the doctor. And the first uh, of those 150 victims to... Uh, stand up and, and call him out was a lady named Rachel Den Hollander, a very courageous woman, uh, a deeply devoted follower of Jesus. And uh, in, the inter- in one of the interviews that she did later, they asked her, well, how did all of this stuff affect your, your faith in God? And she said it was hard. It was hard. She, she said, God, how could you allow this thing to happen to me if you're a good God? I mean, where, where, where were you when this happened in my life? And the interviewer said, well, how did you, how do you resolve that? She said, well, I went back to the Bible. And she said, and in particular, I went back to this verse that we're looking at here today. Lord, to whom else will I go? You alone have the words of eternal life. She said, I didn't always understand. I didn't know why. I didn't get it all. I, 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 I struggle with it. But Lord, where else would we turn? You alone are God. And so I trust you you. See, you you can't do it on your own. You have to trust Jesus. It is the essence of being a true follower of Jesus. Maybe today as we've been talking, you know, Jesus has been banging on your machine. He's been saying to you, look, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're going to be a follower of me, then I have to be Lord of your life. And if it feels a little a little rough, if it feels a little, little, little startling, it's not because he's mean, it's because he's kind. It's because he wants you to understand. He, he wants the penny to drop because he's the bread of life. He's the one that will satisfy that spiritual hunger in your life. You can look at all kinds of other places. You're just not going to find the kind of satisfaction that your soul needs. He alone is the one who gives that. But he insists that he be the Lord of your life. There is no other way that he will do it. You will never be satisfied otherwise. And so he rattles you. But his goal is not to drive you away. His goal is to invite you in and he pleads with you. Look, you don't want to leave too, do you? Come and follow me. You know, when it comes to a passage like this, if you're a genuine follower of Jesus, then sometimes you get a little nervous. Like, oh, you know. I don't do this all the time. Am I, am I an admirer? Am I, you know, and, and if, if the Holy Spirit has been convicting you as we've been talking, then you just listen and say, okay, God, in this, life, in this part of my life, I, I do, I, I give it to you again. I, I submit to you again. Help me, help me God to do it. And that's okay. If you accept this idea and you lean into it, even if you don't get it perfect, you're a follower of Jesus. On the other hand, if the penny did drop for you today, then you need to decide. I mean, Jesus or you? Who's going to be the Lord of your life? 
Because see, the life of an admirer of Jesus is kind of the worst of both possible lives. You, you neither get the apparent freedom of not following Jesus, or nor do you get the genuine freedom and hope and life that comes from following after him. And so the invitation today is to say, okay, okay, Jesus, I believe that you are who you are. I, be I believe that you died and that you rose again. And so, so then you're God. And I'm not God. And so I submit my life to you. I give my life to you. Follow him. He says, my yoke is easy. Not meaning that he doesn't have a yoke, but that, that of all of the options, this is the best. And my burden is light. And you'll find rest for your soul. Come and follow Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we come to you today and we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done in our life. We thank you what you did on the cross, that you rose again. Jesus, we come to understand that, that you demand. If we're going to follow you, we demand that we submit our lives fully and completely to you. God, Jesus, you know it's so hard. That by nature, we want to be our own gods. By nature, we want to set the course. By nature, we want to go our own way. We just want you to help. And we need you, God, forgive us for that. Help us in every area of our life, God, to submit to you, to Jesus, to say you are the Lord. You're the one that we're going to follow. And where we haven't, God, we confess that and we repent, it, repent to you and we say, God, forgive us for that. Give us the strength, Father, to follow after Jesus with all of our heart so that we might find life, so we might know life so that we might experience the abundant life that you have to offer. We give you thanks. We pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for coming and joining us today. I hope that you've been uh, challenged, but also encouraged as you follow after Jesus. Let me send you out with these words. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.